Hello everyone, my name is Fasi Kaima. I'm a physics instructor at Labawi Academy. Today I'm going to present about the physics of injera and the properties of bulk matter for 11th graders. So, to begin with, let us see uh, some properties of bulk matter. As you all know, matter is defined as uh, a substance that can occupy space and has a certain volume, okay? So, the following three are just some properties of these bulk matters. The first one is called elasticity, and the other one is viscosity, and the third one is conductivity. So let's start from the first one, which is elasticity. So we have different materials, and we can categorize these materials as elastic and plastic. So when you come to elasticity, it is defined as the ability to regain its original configuration after the removal of the deforming force. For instance, if you take a rubber band, you can stretch this rubber band until it reaches to its elastic limit, and then when you release it, it will come to its original position or uh, configuration. So this property is called elasticity of material. So in this case, there are two uh, major points that are called stress and strain. Let's see the first one. So stress is defined as the ratio of the force applied per unit area or the ratio of the force applied to the cross-sectional area of that material. And basically, it is the same as pressure, which is measured in Pascal. And strain is due to this stress, there is a deformation. And that deformation ratio with respect to its original length is known as strain of material. And basically, it is measured in millimeter per meter, or we can also take it as just dimensionless physical quantity. Now, there are two points related to this elasticity. The first one is called elastic limit. So, as I have tried to explain before, elastic limit is the maximum limit of a material to regain its original shape or size after the removal of this deforming force. But when you come to the ultimate strength of a material, we can stretch it, we can permanently deform it, but if we apply a force and increase this force uh, continuously, at a certain point, it becomes just break into two, or it may rupture. So that maximum point tells us just the strength of the material, and we call this strength as the ultimate strength of the elastic material. Young's modulus, or sometimes called elasticity modulus, is the other one. So it is the ratio of stress to strain of the material. It tells us just the stiffness of a material. For instance, if you take steel, the Young's modulus of steel is about 200 gigapascal. It means that we have to apply a pressure of 200 gigapascal to stretch one meter uh, length of a steel by additional one meter. Okay, and here also since the strain has no unit, the sign of Young's modulus or elasticity modulus is again Pascal. The shear modulus. So we have different types of forces like axial force and the shear force. Axial force is basically known as normal force. So in that case, we have to apply this force perpendicular to the area so that along the length of that material, we can uh, increase the length. And in this case, we can have uh, uh, axial stress and axial strain. But when you see shear forces, this force should be applied parallel to the area of uh, that material. And in that case, there will be deformation. And as you can see from the diagram, the deformation D and the lengths L are related. So in this case, B, since we apply a force parallel to the area, there is a, a shear force and there is an area A. So the ratio of force to area gives us the stress. And we call this stress as shear stress. The relationship between this stress and corresponding strain is calculated in such a way. So strain is equal to D over L which is the deformation, the change in length that you can see from the diagram, and L is the vertical length. This ratio tells us the strain. So stress to strain will give us a modulus, and that modulus is called shear modulus. Here also, the sign of shear modulus is Pascal. Bulk modulus. So uh, as you can see from this equation, it is a ratio of volume of stress to volume of strain. We basically use this bulk modulus for liquids because we know that liquids have a definite volume but not definite shape. As a result, we have to calculate the change in terms of volume, not in terms of length or width or height. Okay? And therefore, since we have to apply a certain pressure on that volume of liquid and compress it, 
there will be a change in uh, volume and that volume will decrease finally because we have to apply a compressive force, okay? It's a pushing force. And you can see in the formula that there is a minus sign and that minus sign accounts for this compressibility of the liquid. When we compress a liquid, the change in volume will be negative. Initially, we have greater volume, but finally, the volume decreases by some amount. So in this case also, bulk modulus uh, should be measured in Pascal. And different liquids have different bulk modulus. Let's come to other properties or fluid, which is called viscosity. Viscosity is defined as the internal resistance of uh, fluid flow, okay? And it's the measure of thickness of a fluid. As you can see from the diagram, we have three different fluids, and their flow nature is totally different. It depends on the resistance between layers of these fluids. Now, let's see this diagram. So, as you can see, we have different points and we have different velocities of layers of liquid. So when the central uh, line uh, from the diagram, you can see that point C shows a line and that length is, is greater, meaning the velocity layer of that liquid is higher than the others because top and bottom points, like point A, since there is adhesive nature of fluid, its velocity is very small. But when you come to the middle, there is a velocity which is greater than the others. And this tells us how much that fluid is viscous, okay? And when you see the right-hand side uh, diagram, the first one has a very high viscosity, meaning there is velocity difference between layers, but the second one is very low viscosity because all layers have the same velocity. How can we calculate uh, the force that is required to drive layers of the fluid? Okay? We basically calculate uh, this shear force by using this equation, and this equation we have some parameters like eta, which is called the viscosity of the fluid. It is material property. And A is cross-sectional area of the fluid. And change in V over change in Y is a velocity gradient, meaning the velocity difference between two consecutive layers of fluids. And there are different types of uh, viscosities. But for the time being, let's see these two, which are called uh, dynamic viscosity and kinematic viscosity. So when you say dynamic or absolute viscosity, it is the resistance to be deformed when fluid is subjected to a force. But we have also another type called kinematic. In this case, it's the measure of fluid's inherent resistance to flow when no external force except gravity is acting on it. Studies show that there are four basic factors that can affect the viscosity of fluids. So the first one is temperature, the second one is concentration, then attractive forces, and particle size. So when we change the temperature, this viscous, viscosity of fluid will change. For instance, if it increases the temperature, studies show that the viscosity will decrease. Okay? Similarly, if the, concentration, if the concentration of the fluid is just changed or decreased, for instance, it is viscosity will also decrease. And again, attractive force and particle size also affect or changes uh, the viscosity of the fluid. Let's come to the other property, which is thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity is one property of material. It is just the ability of a material to conduct heat. So basically, we classify materials into conductors, semiconductors, and insulators. So if you take, for instance, conductors, these are materials that can conduct heat and electricity, OK? So the rate of this heat flow, or the rate of conduction of heat from hotter object to colder one can be calculated using the equations that you can see from uh, the screen, okay? So Q over T is defined as the time rate of heat flow, which is measured in power, and there are these factors that can affect this rate, flow, rate of heat flow, where K is known as thermal conductivity. It depends on the type of material from which that material, I mean, that uh, conductor is made of. A is cross-sectional area, and change in T, T1 minus T2 over L is uh, temperature gradient per unit length. So you can see the diagram that we have hotter and cooler objects to the left and right hand side. And in between, we have one conductor which connects these two objects, okay? So heat will flow through that cross-sectional area. And the length of that cylindrical object which connects these two objects affects the rate of heat flow. The cross-sectional area affects the heat flow. Again, the type of material from which the cylinder is made of affects the rate of heat flow. So 
From this uh, diagram, you can see that some experimental values of thermal conductivity. So different uh, materials have different thermal conductivities. Now, considering all this into account, let's try to integrate the concept of this properties of bulk matter with injera. Okay? The first one is elasticity of injera. So as you all know, uh, injera has elasticity, but it's gluten-free. In science, studies show that foods that are certain elasticity are dependent on the gluten. But there is no research which shows us the elasticity nature of injera because it has no uh, gluten, but still it has a certain elasticity. And again, research shows that there is a stress-to-strain relationship between injera. And these injera samples, this is the data that we get from a certain study, and this injera sample backed from F butter were analyzed using dynamic mechanical analysis. And from this, we can take any point from the diagram and find the ratio of stress to strain to find the elasticity nature or the stiffness of injera. And the other relationship between viscosity and butter of TAFE is viscosity of butter of TAFE is affected by type of TAFE, level of fermentation of upset, and the amount of water used to make butter. Okay? And basically here, the weight of injera is dependent on the viscosity of the butter of TAFE. And research again shows that as the viscosity of that butter of TAFE increases, the weight of injera will also increase. And when you come to thermal conductivity, so this thermal conductivity again affects the texture of injera, okay? So heat will transfer from the clay, or we call it metad, toward this the butter of TAF. In that case, the amount of heat energy transferred, or the way that heat energy is transferred toward this butter of TAF affects the texture of injera, okay? And from one research, we can see that thermal conductivity of butter of TAF and injera is about 0.53 watt per mole Kelvin and it's about 0.558 watt per mole Kelvin respectively. Now, other than the concept of injera, we can see applications of concept of elasticity, viscosity and thermal conductivity. So when you come to the first one, which is elasticity, I have tried to explain before, it is the ability to regain uh, its original configuration after the removal of the deforming force. From the diagram, you can see that uh, we have a stress-strain relationship for concrete, cast iron, and mild steel. So if you see, for instance, concrete, uh, it is very short in length. Its slope is uh, uh, less than that of cast iron and mild steel. From this, we can say that its Young's modulus is uh, very low, and it comes to rupture point uh, before with respect to the mild steel. And the other one is viscosity. In our day-to-day -day life, we have fluids that are viscous, so we have to see their nature and depending on their uh, thickness or internal resistance between layers of fluids, we can categorize this one is viscous and this one is non-viscous. So we can see honey, nail polish and oil. So these have different viscosities because their uh, flowing nature is totally different as a result of this fluid layer uh, resistance. So for thermal conductivity, Intentionally, uh, we have used, for instance, such kind of exhaust system, which is made of ceramic, to decrease the thermal conductivity. In this case, we are decreasing thermal conductivity means we are keeping other materials from heat so that they will not be damaged by heat. Now, let's recap what we have seen so far. So we have seen uh, properties of bulk matters like elasticity, viscosity, and thermal conductivity. So, Elasticity is a property of material. It is the ability of material to regain uh, its original shape or size after the removal of deforming force. And viscosity is the resistance of fluid flow and it measures the thickness of the fluid. And the other one is thermal conductivity, which is a property of material or it is the ability to conduct heat. And we already said that injera has elasticity but it has no gluten. Uh, still, there is no research which shows why it has such kind of property. And the other one is the butter of TAF has a certain viscosity. It is viscous, and this viscosity depends on different factors, and it also affects the weight of injera. And when it comes to thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity of butter of TAF affects texture of injera. And that's all for today. Thank you.